are so excited to have uh, Kayleen Holt here today to interview. She is an ex instructional design consultant and the owner of Scissor Tail Creative Services, LLC, a talented and nimble company that creates custom learning experiences. We're here to chat with Kayleen today about two incredibly helpful articles uh, that I stumbled across recently that she's written on her blog called Scissor Tail's Learning Nest. So hi, Kayleen, how are you doing today? Hi, Cecile. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so the first article I wanted to ask you about is the one uh, that was shared with me. Actually, uh, Leeway <laughs> sent this over to me a few weeks ago, and it's very aptly named How to Become an Instructional Designer, the Ultimate Resource List. I say aptly because this resource list is truly extensive. Um, you've listed blogs, podcasts, videos, organizations, social media groups, and even Twitter accounts of ID influencers that are very um, well known as well as communities and also new ones that I didn't know about that I was happy to discover um, through your article. So my first question is, what was your motivation for creating this list and when did you start sort of bookmarking or compiling it? Um, well, I'm a part of a lot of different Facebook groups and online communities, Slack groups and so on. And, and even on LinkedIn, I kept seeing the same questions over and over from people who are wanting to become an instructional designer. And right now, of course, there are a lot of teachers wanting to transition. And so I kept answering the same questions over and over. I would, I would say, oh, well, you know, if you're a teacher looking to get into ID, you really need to hook up with Sarah Stevick and get her, you know, get in that community. Um, also, you know, Devlin Peck posts a lot of things to help people get started. Kara North posts LinkedIn job posts all the time. I kept saying the same things over and over. And I thought, you know, I really should just compile a list and, you know, put something together so I can send people a link and go, here you go. Here's a bunch of information to help you get started. Have fun. And then I started thinking about, well, what helped me when I got started? And Really, when I got started, and I I was a teacher in my former life, and um, when I started, I didn't have a lot of money to go back to school or spend on a certificate program or even buy very many books. And what really helped me get started were bloggers. Some of the people I followed early on were uh, Kathy Moore, Cami Bean, Christy Tucker, Tom Coleman with Articulate, and right. I learned so much. It was years before I ever started working with Articulate, but I learned so much from Tom Coleman's blog. And also the other thing that really helped me a lot was following people on Twitter. There's a lot of conversation that happens on Twitter and also on LinkedIn um, that just helped me learn more about instructional design. So I thought, you know, people, what, what would I want to know if I were brand new starting over and just put together a big long list? <laughs> I'm so glad you did that. It it's helped so many people and I'm sure it will continue to. So I'm glad. Um, awesome. And, and that makes a lot of sense. I, I definitely noticed some of the same patterns that you have, which is um, since the pandemic, a lot of teachers have been wanting to move over into instructional design and mm -hmm. you know, they're kind of like, where do I get started? Um, so I, I definitely can uh, understand that. Okay. So as you mentioned, you were a teacher before you formally entered the learning design space. Was there an aha moment when you knew you wanted to make the transition into learning design or sort of what inspired you to make this um, change? Well, I don't know that it was a moment so much as maybe a series of moments. Um, but when I started teaching years ago, back when I was young and starry eyed and very idealistic, I thought about some of the teachers that I had had in school who you could tell kind of checked out a long time ago. Oh. Um, some of the ones that weren't that effective. Now I had some really great, wonderful teachers. I think we all did. Um, but there were some that you could tell they were just kind of hanging in until retirement. <laughs> I, I promised myself when I started that if I ever got to that point where I didn't love it, I wasn't excited about it, that I needed to get out. And I got to that point. Um, I was my last year of teaching, I was just in a school district that was a really bad situation for me. And I was miserable and thought, yeah, I need to do something else. Um, and when I started thinking about what that something else was, 
um, first, I, I just knew I liked creating instructional materials. Over the course of my career, I had usually worked in small rural schools that were very poor and didn't have many resources. And so I ended up creating a lot of my own materials in lieu of textbooks. Um, and I discovered I really like doing this. You know, I am an introvert through and through and interacting with hundreds of people every day is very, very draining for me. Um, on top of how draining teaching is as a career anyway, it's a very difficult job. But um, for me, I much rather be behind the scenes. Um, and so I started out by forming a small company where I was selling the educational materials that I had developed over the years. I had these multimedia things. I would go to um, language teachers conferences and sell my CDs. I didn't make very much money at that. <laughs> so I got to a point after a couple of years, I thought, you know, I really need a, a study, study job. And so um, along the line of, you know, like when I was trying to come up with what to put on my business cards, uh, what is my title other than, you know, company owner? What am I doing? Well, I'm designing instruction. So maybe that makes me an instructional designer. And then I Googled it to see it, uh, and to see what that meant and was surprised to find out that's a real job. Hey, mm -hmm. and I started looking into what instructional designers do and what skills they need and all of that. And I thought, you know what, that would be a really good fit for me. That's, that's what I love to do and I'm good at. And um, so when I started looking for a real job, <laughs> I looked for instructional design jobs and I was very blessed and fortunate to, to land a job as a junior instructional designer with a company that um, did a lot of government contract work. So I worked with a ton of government agencies as well as some private corporations and some nonprofit organizations. And I learned a lot. Now I say I was blessed and fortunate because one of the people who conducted my interview was a former teacher. And so she really helped me land the job, honestly, because she was there translating for me. You know, I had done some Googling. I knew what Addie was and I knew, you know, some of the other terms, but not everything. And one of the other interviewers was kind of trying to stump me, I think sometimes. And he had asked me these questions and she would just lean over and tell me, you know, he's, he asked, you know, tell me about how you use Gagne's nine events of instruction and, you know, my deer in headlights look, and she's leaning over going, that's like Madeline Hunter. And I, I was like, oh, so he wants to know what kind of lesson plan model I use. Okay, well, this is what I do. And got the job and learned a lot, had some great mentors along the way. That's, that's awesome. I'm just like still taking in everything you said. <laughs> but first, like awesome that you made that promise to yourself and really to students in the future generations, right? To make sure that, you know, when you reach a point that it's time to check out, that you're not just hanging on there, um, you're doing what's best, you know, really for the students as well as yourself. And I think right. uh, if hopefully if like more teachers hear that message, they can feel like, okay, because I think it's probably a really big change. I can't imagine since I was not a classroom teacher, but what it's like to you know, kind of like put that behind you and, and move forward with what you learned, but to really transition in a different role. To, to any teachers who are looking to, to transition, think about what you really enjoy doing, because I have known instructional designers who came from teaching and weren't happy in the instructional design role because they wanted to be out there with the learners, interacting with the learners and everything. And so many times I don't get to see my stuff in action. I, you know, I turn it over to someone else who then teaches it and I don't get to see that light bulb moment over the learners, you know, heads and all of that stuff that was really rewarding as a teacher. Now, there are plenty of opportunities in L&D for both kinds of people, whether you want to be behind the scenes or whether you want to be there in the classroom engaging with learners, there's, you can, you can do it. In fact, some instructional design positions do it all. So really look at what is it do you like to do and find the role that best fits that. 
thank you so much for sharing also like how you got started and what that interview was like. I, I think it could be very daunting. And I know that there are sometimes biases against teachers when they're starting to transition, but I've also heard the other side where, oh no, they're preferred. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not sure. Did you feel like there was one way more, you saw one way more than the other? I, I I've seen both. And I think in equal amounts, um, teachers do have really valuable experience and skill sets. In fact, I have a blog post about that, about traits that teachers already have that make them excellent instructional designers. Um, so if you're a teacher, go look for that on my, on my blog, because if you're, if you're suffering with imposter syndrome or lack of confidence thinking, can I really do this? Let me tell you, especially if you have been designing your own lessons Yes, you can. You can do this. And even if you are a teacher who has relied more on the textbook, um, if you have very strict standards that you have to met, meet and you don't have a lot of creative freedom, you still have a lot of useful skills to bring to the instructional design profession. Now, unfortunately, as you pointed out, Cecile, there are plenty of people who don't believe that or I've met people who have kind of a prejudice against teachers. They um, maybe don't think teachers are professional enough or that we can translate our skills over to teaching adults. Um, but you know, there are, there are snobby people in every profession. <laughs> and I'm just gonna say that, yes, I've met some, some snobby people who think that teachers can't do it. I've met some snobby people who think that if you are an instructional designer, you can't be a good trainer. Um, that's not true either. Everyone has their skill sets and some people are better at some things than others. Um, so yes, that first interview that I had, there were two people in the interview. One was the former teacher who was an excellent mentor. In fact, she's a good friend of mine now and works with me to this day. Um, the other was a program manager who was of the other um, side of that thinking that, oh, I don't know about teachers. I don't know if they can do this. And so he got, he tested me. In fact, months after I started, when he came to, we, we had a performance evaluation, actually it was my 90 day performance evaluation. He told me, you know what? I didn't think you were going to be able to do this. I threw everything I could at you because I want, honestly wanted to see you fail. And you didn't, you knocked it out of the park. You you really get this. And he said, I'm sorry. That's, you know, you shown me that you can do it. And so that's what we have to do. We just have to show them. <laughs> uh, I, I can't imagine what it's like hearing that. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, what I heard from other people that he did kind of the same thing to them. So it's, <laughs> yeah. Does it make it okay? <laughs> no, it does not. But I'm glad, you know, you handled it well and, you know, you have that story to tell other people um, who may be in similar situations. Maybe this is just me. I think it's just a little more difficult sometimes being a woman and uh, Absolutely. You know, the things we go through. Um, but that that wasn't on the docket today. So <laughs> <laughs> taking it oh, that's time. OK. We can go there. <laughs> I can tell you that that has been one of the challenges working with SMEs sometimes is um the the female voice just doesn't get heard as as well sometimes as the male voice when you're all in a room um and you just have to prove yourself a little bit more it's unfortunate that that's the way it is but it has been sometimes it's something we're we're kind of learning how to like navigate and hopefully addressing more and more and that's that's one thing in especially meetings where i'm just getting to meet the SMEs. I used to just, you know, I am Kayleen, I'm an instructional designer, I'm here to help, blah, blah, blah. But now when I introduce myself, I have to remember, okay, hey, I'm Kayleen, I have, you know, 25 plus years of experience in education and instructional design. I have a master's degree in instructional technology, you know, and go on in educational technology. And, you know, really let them know. I'm an expert at what I do and then kind of talk about the roles, you know, that recognizing that they're the expert in the content and I'm not there trying to be that expert. I'm there to, to 
help them teach their content in the best way possible. And that's my expertise. And, you know, just talking about how we work together. And I found that that really helps start that relationship off better because so many times they will, whether it's men or women, so many times the subject matter expert will just assume that they're the boss (laughs) and you're going to do what they say and don't really understand how the two roles work well together. Yeah, definitely that, that can be the case sometimes. Um, (laughs) So let me ask you a little bit about your other article. This one was, this one was my favorite. Uh, It was how to get instructional design experience to build your portfolio. I wish I had read this in 2017 when I graduated (laughs) because I was really scratching my head, like trying to put myself out there, but not in a way that was meaningful, especially if someone didn't know what an instructional designer was. Mm -hmm. So I loved this article. You highlight this very profound struggle between getting your first ID job and gaining the experience to get that job. Do you mind kind of explaining this challenge in your own words? Well, so many entry level job postings will say minimum one year experience or minimum three years of experience or five years of experience. It's like they don't understand what entry level means. And so I've seen that from instructional designers over and over and over, this frustration that how am I supposed to land one of these jobs when they all say they want experience? Um, And here's, here's what I have to say about that. First of all, understand that the people who put together job postings, job descriptions, are not always the same people who are hiring, not always the same people who need someone on their team. Um, And also they, a lot of the time, the job descriptions aren't carefully crafted and thought out. They're pulled together, copy and paste jobs from different things, or it's a committee that gets together and says, what is our ideal candidate? What would they be like? And they come up with this unicorn that no one could possibly be like. Um, So my advice is don't self-select yourself out of a job. Don't look at the job posting and go, oh, well, I don't have all that, so I can't apply. Obviously, if it's for like a senior level position in your junior level, no, don't apply for that. But if it's a, a position that pretty well fits most of your skills and qualifications and you can look at that and go, yeah, I think I could do that, apply for it. You know, explain in the cover letter how you um, are qualified for it. Don't let their laundry list of unicorn qualifications keep you from applying. But yeah, the article was about, you know, how to how to get some experience to put into your portfolio. Now, when I started, I didn't have a portfolio. I wasn't asked for a portfolio, so I got lucky. Um, but now I think more and more jobs want you to have that. And I'll be honest, when I was on the, when I was at that job where I had worked my way up to senior instructional designer and project manager, and I was helping with the hiring decisions. And when I was on the other side of that interview desk, portfolios mattered. Like if someone sent me a resume and they had a link to a portfolio in there, that always got my attention more than ones that didn't. And if the portfolio looked really good, yeah, absolutely. I want to talk to you and I want to get you on my team. So um, it matters. And so if you haven't had a real job yet in learning and development, but you need to put together a portfolio. If you if you did one in your graduate program, great, you can use that. If not, or even if you did, you can add to it. Um, look for ways, you know, look for a problem you can solve at your current organization, at your church or some other organization you're in. Um, you look for those volunteer opportunities. I listed some, some of those in that post, but also if you have a, a local community organization that you love and want to help, contact somebody there and say, hey, do you have any training needs? Is there anything there I can help you with? You, do you need an e-learning course, a manual developed, anything else? Um, you know, we were talking about the rescue organizations where we got our dogs. You know, maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe you have a, an organization like that that you would just really love to support. Reach out to them and see what you can do because they are always wanting volunteers. And 
when you so some of these uh places that you listed on your blog are really helpful because it seems like they're specifically geared towards like instructional design help which is good because you don't have to necessarily explain what it is if if there's not already right. a value there um but if you have you also tried going to like other places like you kind of uh, talked about the like the animal rescue if there's a place that's like less familiar with what instructional designers do do you kind of have any pointers for like how to introduce yourself and like what those services might look like? <laughs> yeah, it, it can be tricky because if you tell someone you're an instructional designer, a lot of the time you get a blank stare. They have no idea what that means. It took years before my own family, my kids, my husband understood what I do. And now I'm, I'm still not sure they fully understand, but, but they sort of get it. They're like, okay, you make training stuff. So that's what I would lead with is try to simplify what you do as much as you can. You know, how do you explain this to your mother-in-law or your elderly neighbor or something, you know, like I make training, <laughs> you know, like, you can say that you can, you can just ask, um, can I help you put together any training? Like if you have employees, do they need orientation materials or, if you want to educate people about what you do, can I put together a little educational video one. for you? Um, just things like that. And you might have some other skill sets that um, that you could offer that might not necessarily be instructional design. Like one of the things I did when I worked with that company that I started with is I wrote a lot of proposals to help win work. And so there is an organization that I love in. Um, the town where my husband grew up and I've offered to help them with grant writing with, you know, writing proposals to win grants. So that's something we're working on, but um, that is not an offer that's available to everybody. Cause it's not, <laughs> it's not something I love doing, but it's, I want to help her um, keep her organization running. So think about what, what skills you have and what you could bring to the table and how you can just help the world be a better place. I love that so much. And I think that message needs to be spread out <laughs> more and more. So but it's it's been such a pleasure to speak with you and to meet you uh, almost in person. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Cecil. I have enjoyed this. Um, it's good talking to you. And uh, I always say I'm out to change the world one learning experience at a time. So that's my challenge to all of you listening. Let's go change the world.